Um, I've been around the world several times in the last year. I have had direct experiences in a variety of industries. And IT manifests, like Dan said this morning, IT itself is broad. And IT manifested in the context of these various industries is even broader. So it's hard to really get your arms wrapped around what this thing is that we call Lean IT. So what I would like to do is share with you eight reflections and leave you with eight uh, what I like to call big hairy questions that we should be thinking about going forward as our understanding of what lean in the realm of IT means going forward. So the first observation I would like is that technology has the potential to play a transformative role in every product, every service, and every industry. Can you think of one where it doesn't? And if you can, then maybe you're just not thinking hard enough, okay? I had the CIO of a, of a global bank about a year ago say this. For so long, CIOs have been asking for a seat at the strategy table. Well, surprise, here you are. What are you going to do with it? Okay. Everyone is looking to us suddenly because it's disrupt or be disrupted. And the enabling factor in most cases is our capability uh, to turn IT. So um, I want to ask my first big hairy question, and I'd like to thank Dan Jones because he introduced this question at his opening keynote last year, which is to say, we're so used to thinking about what can we do with this technology, this asset that we have, and we forget to ask what does the customer want. So how do we think from our customer's needs backwards and not our assets forward? If we can really get our arms around that and be willing to abandon things that we consider vital assets, core competencies, things that we embrace as part of who we are, if we're able to let go of that, that's going to make it easier on us. And easier said than done, of course. So that's the first observation and the first big, hairy question. Second observation I'd like to make is that deliberate, and I mean deliberate, it has to be very intentional, innovation is becoming necessary for survival. Is that a bit of a bold statement? Um, is there any established industry now that is not being chipped away at the fringes by lean startups who aren't going for the whole industry, but they're looking for a chunk where they can get a handhold. And once they've got a handhold, then they work their way in. That's how lean startups work. The way established enterprises work is just the opposite. They consolidate their base of assets, okay? So we have a battle being fought on two fields. Uh, differently at the same time, okay? So, um, as a good manner does, Dan is both inspiring and sometimes uh, very difficult <laughs> because he makes me think differently. I have a tendency to be hyperbolic sometimes. I like to think of myself as a, an evangelist of technology. And Dan pulls me up short on this from time to time, and he did this once by introducing me to this book a few years ago. And anybody who has, has not read this book, uh, read it. Our friend uh, Nassim Taleb, who uh, authored Black Swan and uh, recently Anti-Fragile, says one of the most important management books of all time. If you like Taleb, then believe him, this is a good book. What this man does is he debunks all of the popular mythologies, um, Good to Great, uh, Tom Peters, all of these books that we build up around what it be is to be a lasting great organization, and he says nonsense. There is no such thing as sustaining competitive, competitive advantage. Look at the data. Don't listen to the compelling hyperbolic arguments of these great authors that we've all bought into. Look at the data and you will see it is not true. And it's very stark and it's very compelling read. When you get to the end of it, the point this fellow makes in this book is there is only one source of competitive advantage. That is to be able to outthink and out-innovate the competitors. And you don't just do it once, you have to do it every day. Okay? Because nothing lasts forever, especially anymore. Nothing lasts a year anymore. And we see this going faster and faster all the time. Are we gonna hit a, hit a wall at some point where it can't go any faster? I doubt it. So um, just a short while ago, um, I went up to uh, my neighbor in Seattle, a company called Nordstrom. Maybe here in Europe you don't know about Nordstrom, but they are a classic a retailer who is known for their uh, just insane customer service. Okay, their focus is on customer service. And they have an innovation lab going on that is, that is playing with a composite of design thinking and lean startup. And here is their 
vision statement right here. They are trying to replicate on the internet the experience that you have when you walk into one of their stores. Personal service. And it's a fascinating thing to see. There's another interesting innovation story playing out right now as we speak. And we have a couple of our friends from Seattle here in the room today. A company you may have heard of called Microsoft and a company you may have called Nokia have decided to get married recently. The interesting backstory behind this is though, Microsoft is evolving from a software company to a devices and services company, an entirely different business model. And they're doing it very quickly and then very disruptively. So suddenly Microsoft has become a very significant manufacturing and supply chain player. And they're here today because they believe very passionately that Lean is one of the keys to help unlock that puzzle. And so um, we did a little traveling together earlier this week. And our first stop was Amsterdam on Tuesday. And we paid a visit to Nike's EMEA headquarters. And uh, we paid a visit to the IT staff innovation lab, where anybody who has a great idea or wants to get a huddle together and put some thoughts together and stick them up on the board, um, here's the place you go to do that. Very, very interesting. Innovation is in the blood. Product creation is in the blood of Nike. And uh, that was a very interesting story. Um, I'll tell you more about our travels with Microsoft a little bit later. So the big hairy question number two, if someone, anyone, anywhere in your company, including your suppliers or customers, has an idea, I didn't say it had to be a good idea, just an idea, what are they supposed to do? Think about it. Really? Seriously, think about it. Are they supposed to send an email, have a phone call, call a meeting, go do something? Because if they don't know what it is they're supposed to do, then how are you going to capture all those great ideas that are coming and going under your nose? So what Nike did, they made a room. And some great stuff's already coming out of that. And that room's only been stood up for a few months, okay? So if, you're, if you believe in open innovation, if you believe in crowdsourcing, if you believe that most of the good ideas that exist for you are out there, not in here, then you need to think this way. You need to act this way. So that's the big hairy question number two. Observation number three, uncertainty can be your friend or your enemy, and, and it's up to you, okay? Any of you who heard me last year, this was the theme. This was the theme of my latest book, Run, Grow, Transform. Uh, which is how do you manage uncertainty? Is it something you try to control? Well, of course you can't, but that doesn't mean people don't try. Um, the idea of governance, of budgeting, of planning, of portfolio management, of having to budget a year in advance for the resources and what you're going to deliver is absolutely nonsense and we all know it, but still many large organizations try to enforce that rigor on, on us and it crushes innovation. Okay. This is what's so exciting about the lean startup. It's easy to be a lean startup if you're a startup. It's very hard to be a lean startup if you're a 100-year-old enterprise. But unless 100-year-old enterprises learn how to think and act like lean startups, they might not be 200-year-old enterprises. So there's a lot here. So the big hairy question number three, how can we balance good governance? We need good governance with the ability to nurture purpose-driven teams to quickly sense and adapt to challenges and opportunities. How do we balance that? And um, it's context sensitive. It's different in every situation, but it's the same question to ask. Okay. The fourth observation I would like to make. I have spent a considerable amount of time in the last two years looking very carefully uh, at the Agile and Scrum industry, particularly in large enterprises, and there's something very interesting going on. Agile works, okay? It works. Lean works. But just like lean, Agile is often more dogma than practice, than learning. But when you go see true lean work, when you go see real Agile work, it's about learning. And what Agile has learned are many sophisticated, very clever techniques of how to bring a team together and work together and produce quality product quickly. Where Agile breaks down often is when you try to do the long, big waterfall projects in rapid iterations because there are more dependencies. Things get bigger and how do you do that? And I'm not saying there aren't organizations that are scaling Agile, 
but they're not as many as you would think they are. They are all struggling with this. This is a big topic right now. So it forces us to ask the question, what is big? Or Scott Ambler, who until recently was the Agile, global Agile director for IBM, said, what are the scaling factors that we need to figure, figure out how to get around? What is big? Well, big is a lot of things. One of the big things is distributed teams. But that's just one of the big things. Complexity, multinational company. We heard about uh, from Michael Jones with eBay. eBay doesn't have one page, they have localized pages no matter what your language. Yet it's the same content in the back end. That's big, that's complex in a different sort of way. So again, there's no prescriptive one size fits all approach to bigness, to scale. But I will tell you this, there are many thought leaders in the Agile industry who have left the single team tools and practices behind years ago, and the focus of their entire effort right now is to scale what they've done from small to large. Jeff Sutherland, for example, the co-creator of Scrum, you'll see a lot in the next year from him on scaling Scrum. Um, he was helpful in, in taking what is, in his belief, is the largest Scrum organization in the world, which is SAP with over a thousand teams, and help them work together. Okay, so patterns, patterns of interaction. Scott Ambler, who I mentioned earlier, who until recently was the practice director, the Agile practice director for IBM Global, has recently published a very good book called Distributed Agile Delivery, DAD, he calls it, which is not so much a model, but it's a narrative of principles and practices of how to take Agile and scale it up. And of course, Agile at scale is not just a collection of small teams. There's a lot more to it than that. But the principles of Agile are adhered to in every way. And they look a lot like the principles of Lean. And um, then there's a fellow named Dean Leffingwell, who is one of the creators of the Rational Unified Process, which is the most well-used uh, methodology for large-scale enterprises. He's also the founder of Rally Software. Uh, and he is the, um, the insight behind this, which is what he calls the scaled agile framework, SAFE. Now, look at this for a minute. We have all the attributes of individual teams at the team level here, but then we have the program level where we introduce architecture and systems programmatically, and then at the portfolio and at the enterprise level. And if you think back, uh, in one of Dan Jones' early slides this morning, he had three layers and some connectivity between them, Ka uh, Kaizen, Value Stream Mapping, Obea, Hoshin Conry. Three layers, team, program, portfolio. Now, this is still a work in process, and Dean will tell you, uh, and this is easy, just, just, just Google or to our Microsoft friends, uh, just Bing, okay? You. You're welcome. Scaled Agile Framework, and behind every one of these objects is a, is a little click, and you'll bring it up, and you'll, you'll read it, and it will explain it, and it'll drill. It's beautiful. I'm not saying this is complete, but this is the best start I've seen at a reference model for Scaled Agile. If you talk to Jeff Sutherland, if you talk to Scott Ambler, if you talk to Dean Leffingwell, they will all say the same thing. The key to making Agile work is to start thinking like a lean enterprise. They use that term in their books. They use it in their teachings. If you're looking for the way to take Agile to the enterprise and to get over those scaling factors, we need to start thinking lean, which is why more and more lean topics are appearing in Agile. Now, I'm not here to say that lean has all the answers for the Agile community, because Agile has a lot of answers for the lean community. They both have a lot to share, and we're starting to see them converge more and more. Okay? But this is a great model. A lean management system. So we, Microsoft and I, went to Nike. Our primary purpose to go to Nike, we were hosted by the EMEA IT director at Nike, and we spent the day looking at their Hoshin Connery and their Obeya room. Two years ago when I was there, they were just standing up uh, Hoshin Connery and a primitive Obeya, and I helped them a little bit, asked them some good questions, and two years later we went back to see what the result was, and it was fabulous. It was just fabulous. I'm not saying they don't have a long ways to go, and they know it, but it's really amazing what has emerged. First of all, they quadrupled the size of the Obeya room. Within three months, they realized they were trying to do Obeya in a closet, and it just doesn't work. Because the moment you start doing Obeya, everybody wants to have their meetings in that room, because all of the information you need to make decisions is in that room. 
And so it becomes a magnet. So um, you really have to do some things to make it a working room. It is not wallpaper. It is decisionable information. And it was an extraordinary day. Then, um, the next day we went to Brussels where Pierre Masai hosted us for the day. Um, I, I don't have words for this other than to say everything fits. Everything fits. We grilled them for hours. We asked them every conceivable question. We twisted and turned this Rubik's Cube every way, at every level, from enterprise strategy to annual plans to business as a customer to IT fixing their own backyard to individual initiatives at the function level, at the program level, to the R&D. IT is a function of R&D. And they never even blinked. They could say, well, right over here you'll see this, and this connects to this, and it drills down to an A3. Um, this was just really masterful, okay? And um, it is all in a single room. Now, from this room, this was the management obeya. There were dozens of other rooms in this building, and they're all obeyas at the functional level or the project level, but anyone in any of those rooms, if you got to the point where you reached the boundary of that obey in that room, they could say, now I'm going to take you down to the second floor into this room, and I'm going to take you to this object, and we're then going to continue cascading down. It had referential integrity throughout the entire model. Okay. So it was, it was fabulous. Now, I, I, the question is, how long does it take an organization who's just getting started to get to this level? I don't know. They invented it decades ago. Um, and it may look different for different companies if, if another company should ever get to this point. Um, but it really was an incredible experience. And, and this, by the way, if I didn't make this clear, this is the CIO of Nike, or I'm sorry, Toyota Europe. And this is his management obey room that connects to European strategy, that connects to global strategy. Okay. So the big area question number four, what are your constraining scaling factors? And I'm not just talking about agile here. Um, distributed teams, and they don't have to be agile teams, they can be any teams. What are your scaling factors? Identify what your scaling factors are, and then say how will a skillfully executed lean management system help you overcome them, okay? Because this is not just an Agile challenge, but it is where the Agile community is right now. Observation number five, the elephant in the room is not going away, okay? He's there and he's angry and he's gonna stick around for a while. So um, some of you may know, this is where I got my start years ago. I came out of accounting um, into ERP for many years in manufacturing. That's where I encountered Lean for the first time in the 90s. And for the first many few years of my career in my first book, it was about make what is this Lean thing and what does it have to do with ERP because the two seemed at, at war with each other. And then that led to other things and I sort of led myself away from ERP for several years saying something like, geez, I'll never do that again. But what I've seen in the last few years particularly in the world of seeing what Agile and Scrum can do. I don't know if any of you who were here last year uh, to see the presentation on solar applying Scrum technique to um, an SAP stand-up. It was fabulous, and I thought, okay, there's something here. So I, against my better judgment, I accepted an ERP engagement a few months ago with a mid-sized family-owned, because I needed the leadership to be fully on board with this, agribusiness, ERP selection and implementation. And the reason I said yes was they already had a lean uh, transformation underway. They were doing Hoshin Connery at the leadership level. They were doing uh, flow and pull at the plant level, but they had about 150 Excel spreadsheets running the company. And I don't know if you, you know what ERP stands for, Excel replacement project. <laughs> and my key learning used to be, did this a lot years ago, you focus on the requirements, you get the checklist, you do the demos. I threw that all away. The only thing I focused on for the few, first few months was build the team, backfill the team, get the team gelled to know what it is, what your current state is, what your target state is, and then step back and let the team tell you what's important. Let the team run the selection process. Let the team run the implementation process. 
you need to let them stumble a couple of times and pick themselves up and say, boy, this really is hard. You, you warned us, but we didn't believe you. This really is hard. But the key, but even before you get to iterations and learning and sprints and, and releases and all of that stuff, is you need a team that hangs together through thick and thin. Because every once in a while, one of them's going to fall down, and the rest of the team has to step in and pick them back up. <clears throat> the moment it, uh, an expert has to step in and do it, you lose it. The game is over right then. And so that is my uh, key takeaway with that. So the big hairy question, if ERP can become agile and promote standardized work and reduce information waste and errors and enable data-driven decision-making, can it add value to the lean enterprise? Change this to a negative. If ERP can't do these things, can it be a lean enterprise? Or will it just be an anchor dragging behind the ship forever? A really big one. Okay, so um, I think there is a big future in rethinking ERP. And the big consulting firms are not going to like it because it means empowering the companies to break it down into small chunks, manage and prioritize their backlog, and manage change, and drive out the complexity. Okay, and take, take control, because most are not in control. Observation number six, analytics is a critical skill that must be developed intentionally. So there are people who dream in color, there are people who dream in black and whites, and there are people who dream in heat maps. Okay? Those people who dream and truly dream analytic and think analytic are a rare breed. I'm not saying you can't make one, but if you have one who is that way naturally, you have a valuable thing and you need to treat it carefully. You need to nurture it. In the absence of those, any hack with Excel and some pivot tables and a few, you know, a few pieces of eye candy can fake it and nobody will ever know. Okay. But real analytics, um, a client of mine about a year ago, I'm not going to tell you what industry, I'm not going to tell you who or where or when because they have not given me permission to share that with you, but they're big. And they were having some service troubles. And so the CIO called me and said, we need to stand up a quality program. And we brought in a real Six Sigma black belt. And what I mean by that is not a correspondence course black belt, but a real black belt whose last job was doing Six Sigma in a nuclear power facility, a real black belt. And six months later, we had things like this, okay? We had weekly one-hour meetings with a member of the executive board, the CIO, all of the CIO's direct reports in the room for an hour once a week saying, what happened last week and what did we learn from it? After two months, the CIO said, this isn't enough time. We need to make this 90 minutes every week. And the room kept getting bigger because stakeholders kept being sucked in magnetically into this room because things were happening in this room. And after a while, the CIO literally would close every meeting saying, this is my favorite meeting of the week because we get things done here. We actually know what we're talking about here. He left the room with a smile on his face. Even when he had a bad week, he left the room with a smile on his face because we were doing real root cause analysis. But this is an organization with a mainframe in the basement running a couple billion cycles a day. But that was all data. That was all data. And we had somebody who built a team methodically over several months that knew what to do with this data. And over time, they were able to reduce the variation, cut the long tails off, and shift the mean. And they got everything. Everything was special cause variation, by the way. Every incident, they never quite seen anything like that before. So it took months. Um, and that has become the new model at this organization. Now they're building their whole enterprise-wide uh, quality program around that. So I'm here to tell you, every lean person in this room, that real Six Sigma has a purpose. You don't lead with it, but when you find a tenacious, wicked problem like this, surrounded by lots of data, it is the right tool, but it needs to be handled properly. So if you have an anal... Now, here's the other thing. Um, just like banks sucked all the talent out of math and physics in the last 20 years, anybody that wanted to make a million dollars didn't go into science, they went into banks, and you know where that got us. The same thing is happening right now with analytics. The good analytics people are being sucked into big data with the big data firms who are just cashing in. 
So don't expect to go out and be able to afford and hire big data people for yourself. But if you have one, you have someone who has that talent, nurture them, grow them, develop them. Um, because domain knowledge is half the battle. Can bringing somebody in with just good analytics skills who doesn't know your business, there's a, there's a learning curve there. So my big hairy question number six is how do we find or attract individuals within our organization who are gifted in analytics? Help them develop mastery and help them share their talent with others, with others who may not be gifted but have the capability and build that capability because it's the C in PDCA. And sometimes it's simple, and sometimes it's wicked, okay? But real analytics, real data-driven decision-making um, is a powerful thing, especially when you can visualize it and understand it and draw the sort of correlations and, and, and conclusions that these folks were drawing here. Two more. You cannot ignore the second principle. Okay, everybody, what's the first principle? Value. What's the third principle? Flow. What's the fourth principle? Pull. What's the fifth principle? Perfection. What's the second one? Value stream. What do most companies on the lean journey do? The four, but miss the one? But if you miss the one, if you miss the notion of value streams, all of the others will yield suboptimal gains. They will be gains, and they may even stick around for a while, but they will not persist because the end-to-end -end value ownership and persistence of those gains and continuous improvements of those gains will not happen because nobody owns the end-to-end. End-to-end -end is a popular phrase. Rolls right off the tongue. End-to-end -to -end this. I need end-to-end -to -end that. Next time somebody says end-to-end, -end, stop them and say, what do you mean by that? Who owns it? Who's responsible for the end-of-pipe outcome? Okay. And if they can't answer that question, then end to end is just a, a phrase, just a phrase. Um, to continue the story from the last point, though, what happened in this enterprise when we saw this happening and why that room grew every week for months on end is eventually every stakeholder end to end in this whole process was in that room and looking at those daily misreports. And suddenly, one day, the CIO realized, this is end-to-end, -end, isn't it? I said, yeah. And he said, let's do this again and again and again. Because we solve problems only when all the people were in the room. Because if, if the guy that owned that dot there solved his problem, it, it may not have affected the outcomes. They might have got lucky. It might have. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is value streams are necessary for sustainable results. But ask yourself this question, what is a value stream in IT? I'm gonna leave that pregnant question. That's the question I tried to answer in my last book, Run, Grow, Transform, and I think I got close. But even as it went off to the publisher, I started drawing models and I thought, well, that's not quite right. And I finally decided there's no prescriptive way to do it, but you have to go down that journey for yourself. I left you a few uh, starting points uh, in one of the chapters. Um, uh, but Dan and Jim, way back in 96, Lean Thinking, chapter 11, was it? Um, said it, value streams are fractals. There's a hint. Value streams are fractals. If you're looking for a thing called a value stream, you, you will find a few core value streams, but then there are fractal value streams, patterns of value streams off that, and IT typically is a fractal supporting value stream. Doesn't make it any less important, unless you're an eBay or an Amazon, where your core business, your core development, your core delivery, your core support business is technology. Then IT is maybe your core value stream. In any case, map it, try and figure this out. Try and find one and do the uh, model line on IT. Last observation. Um, and this came out loud and clear in our visit to, to Brussels with uh, Pierre just, uh, wow, yesterday. Prioritize all IT activities and investments according to your Hoshin plan. Um, probably many of you have a fascination with physics and the nature of the universe like maybe I do. And it's like, why are we here? And why is it there? And how did that happen? Um, and what is a singularity after all? And what was before that? Um, but what these, these really smart people 
who, who dream in equations, by the way, will tell you is that half of the matter in the universe does not reflect any light. We don't know it's there, but we know it's there. We knew it by equations, and then we eventually proven it. Well, we have that situation in IT, too. Half of the demand that comes through every day and half of the work we do is dark matter. It's there, it has a gravitational pull, it consumes capacity. It's just not visible, okay? So we have to abolish it. How do we abolish it? How do we make demand visible so that we know it's there, so that we can then make informed decisions on what we do about it? Um, it was very interesting when we spoke with Pierre. Um, don't try this at home, but the president of Toyota Europe gives an annual IT spend to Pierre. And Pierre is literally the person who makes the final decision on how that money is spent. Okay? And so there's a planning process, the Rishi process, which is A3s, charters, business cases, call them what you will. And they all roll up eventually to Pierre, who gets to divvy out how we're going to spend the money. Now, at this point, stop and say to yourself, how would this work in my company? There would be probably a mutinous experience at your company. But Pierre says, well, first of all, if there's a Rishi, if there's a, if there's a project request, and I don't see explicit connection in his obey room to his Hoshin, I'm going to say, where'd that one come from? Explain to me how this adds value to your organization in a way that supports the enterprise goals. And if you can't, that's a no-starter. Okay? So maybe we've just discovered that value and Hoshin Conry and linking initiatives to enterprise value is the perfect portfolio management system, the perfect government system. And if all the, p the pieces work and can be trusted, that they do work, and there is never a question of trust at Toyota. I saw it. If it's on your wall, it's right, right? Because uh, I'm holding you accountable. Respect for people, by the way, means we hold you accountable. If you, if you give us your word that you're going to do something and you don't, I'm holding you accountable for that. I'm not going to say, oh, that's, I'm sorry. You know, and better, better luck next time. It's no, how are you going to fix this? How are you going to come through? Because if we shift your project out, all of the other cascading dependencies, that ripples through the whole company like shock waves. We can't afford that. Respect for people means you need to respect everybody else and keep your promises. That's what respect for your people means. And it works because um, Pierre, at the end of the year, can say to the president, I spent our company's money on IT investments in the best way because each business case that came to me from every function in the business, from every program, from every project, I was able to line up and say, with the limited amount of resources I have, this was the optimal equation of spend across discretionary, across non-discretionary, across regulatory, and he was able to defend it and say, I did my best, and here are the results. I can show you visually, okay? That's a pretty high bar. But if we're all looking for what does a lean governance, planning, budgeting, portfolio management process look like that isn't akin to the wild, wild west, it's not a political process, it's a value-driven process, that would seem to be a pretty good darned example of how you might want to do it. And if, you, if I were to take you back to Dean Leffingwell's slide, if you really deconstruct it, there's Hoshin in there. There's, there's a, the, the three-layer cake of the lean management system in there. So what we have, what we love in IT is a reference model, don't we? We like to look at a reference model and say that has integrity, has referential integrity. If we trust that everything in that model works, then the whole model should work. And it has referential integrity. So if we're looking for a referential model for portfolio and value of IT investing, um, I saw it yesterday. So, now, the question is, the old saying, I don't remember who said that, but sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So if any of you were to take your people into that room and you were to look at that and go, wow, I want that, and I want it now, forget it. You have to start where you are with what you have. But you have someone who's charted a course, and then you have to figure out what is the vital few next steps I need to do across the whole organization in concert to take our next step in that direction. It's not like you're going to get there in a year or five years. What I saw on um, 
Tuesday in Amsterdam and Nike was a darn good progress in two years from what I had seen before. But they still got a long ways to go. But the good thing is, they know it. They could point where the gaps were. They could point where the disconnects were. But what the IT director said was, everybody wants meetings in this room now. That's why we had to make it bigger. That part is working. Okay. So back to Kampala, back to Grameen. This is Sarah. Remember the Gemba walk we took into the deep, dark uh, cornfields of Uganda? She runs the CKW program for Uganda, and she was our Gemba walk leader that day. We spent a long day in a bouncing van with Sarah. We came back the next day, and the first day, we took the whole leadership team, and everybody did a Kanban, and then we put them up on the wall, and we talked about them. We made each leadership member Column for demand, what is your demand? Oh my God, that was a learning experience right there. Dark matter is now exposed and made visible. What are your priorities? And that's a good question. What's your work in process? What's your workload? And what are the problems you're having? And that, it took two hours. It was all it did, it took two hours. I'm not saying it was complete by any means, but they, at the end of that two hours, had a better idea of these four elements than they had ever had before. And that's the look you see in Sarah's eyes. She's like, uh-huh. Okay, I get it now. Kanban is a wonderful thing. The lean people will tell you 5S is a wonderful thing. Some people go 5S crazy. Don't go Kanban crazy. It is not the end, but it is the beginning. It is exposing the dark matter. It is helping you realize demand priority whip and problems. Now, we have a starting point. We know what our current state is in order to balance demand and capacity within our IT organization on the development and the operation side. And it's a good first step, and it's a great icebreaker. So the question, the final question, how do you visualize IT demand, priority, load, and flow? In your organization, it has to be con contextually appropriate. So everyone can clearly align their work with the vital few priorities. And if we can do that, we have begun the real journey. And we can now come together and trust each other rather than just um, continually position around who, who gets what and when. So here's a brief summary. These are my eight observations from this year, the questions we should be asking as the lane community takes, the lane IT community takes another year's step forward where we all go out and learn and share and grow and tell our stories and tweet and blog and do everything we do and then come back together again next year to share once again, Yoka 10, what we have learned. So thank you. <laughs>